everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. Our guests today are Christina Rolo and Dave DeHaan. They co-founded Rolo Mental Coaching in 2005, and their coaching focuses on performance enhancement and quality of life. Both Christina and Dave are internationally recognized experts in the area of performance psychology and mental coaching, especially in tennis. They have extensive experience at the elite and ATP professional level, and they co-authored the book, Mental Training in Tennis, Applied Strategies for Success. You can learn more about them and their backgrounds on their website at rolomentalcoaching.com. In today's conversation, we explore the theme of adversity and transformation with some great stories from professional tennis. Enjoy. So today we'd like to welcome to the Tennis IQ podcast, Christina Rolo and Dave DeHaan. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting us, Josh and Brian. Awesome. And uh, yeah, we'd love to, uh, to start the conversation up by uh, you know, learning a little bit about uh, each of you and uh, your introduction to the sport of tennis and how you got involved in sports psychology. You, you want me to go first? Um, well, uh, I was an athlete, a very young athlete, in it, but I played basketball. And in my younger years, it was quite fast that people saw that I was a performance athlete. And um, I was invited to play for the Dutch national team. And I went to uh, America, to keep it short, on a Division I full scholarship. But why I ended up, um, and I played pro a little bit also, but why I ended up in tennis is because throughout my years, I, I, I liked playing uh, basketball, but I loved tennis. Uh, it wasn't allowed. My parents didn't have the kind of money to support a, a tennis career. So they gave me some basketball shoes and say, go play that sport. Turned out well. I mean, I got a scholarship, got my education paid for uh, playing uh, basketball for UNC Asheville. Uh, but uh, tennis was always my, my passion. Uh, I played tennis on the side, although never really like competition. And when I stopped playing basketball, I started getting back into what I studied for. And I studied psychology in college and I was focused on uh, high performance coaching and I also, around this time, got to know Christina and uh, kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave. With me, um, I was a, a tennis player and I became um, very, very passionate about uh, psychology at the time because I could see I didn't have the resources to pay for a coach and uh, in the regionals to be able to uh, access the nationals. I sometimes would face opponents that were uh, stronger uh, than me in terms of technical, physical, tactical, and uh, I would end up uh, winning against them. And uh, it made me uh, kind of self-reflect, what, what is this? And uh, I discovered that was my mental strength, like the fighting spirit, the determination that got me to participate in the national tournaments. And from there, uh, when I decided what I wanted to pursue as a career, I had to make a decision and I chose sports sciences. But a couple of years later, they had in Portugal the first international masters in sports psychology. And uh, I saw an opportunity to combine my two passions, sports, and um, also uh, psychology. So I did the, the masters and when I uh, finished and I had to do my uh, master's uh, dissertation, I wanted to do something meaningful and applied. So I contacted the National Tennis Center of uh, Portugal, Lisbon, and uh, I realized they only had technical, tactical and physical coaches, no mental coaches. So I became the first uh, mental coach uh, doing systematic mental training with them, not just in Lisbon, but I would travel with them throughout the country uh, during uh, the, the uh, circuit uh, satellite, satellite tournament circuit. And um, I found out that uh, Portugal didn't have enough resources, uh, enough knowledge, experience in this area for me to uh, progress in my career. So at that time, I decided to go to America, uh, uh, apply to a PhD in North Carolina, UNCG. Uh, and the reason I chose that particular program, I had like four uh, in mind, but I applied to this one because it had scientific based uh, foundations, but was mainly applied. And during that four year program, I had opportunity to uh, learn, but apply the knowledge also 
I work with Division One um, tennis teams. I uh, did several grant projects for NFL, USTA, and the Olympic uh, committees, Mexico, for, uh, America, and that gave me uh, the experience and confidence to be able to uh, later on think about creating this venture, this uh, business to help people in the tennis area, which is our passion. passion. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited with these topics and uh, it's tough for me in a couple of minutes to go through so many years of yeah, my it's life. It's a 20 year career already, so yes. I can understand that you cannot just say that in one minute. <laughs> you can you know. tell like it's been Yeah, tough. yeah. I know. And it's, it's great to have, you know, some international experts like the two of you on our podcast to talk about different things. And I think, you know, one of the major themes that has been going on in the world, obviously with the, the pandemic is, is how people deal with, with adversity, but also perhaps with a theme of transformation. How can we maybe even use, use adversity as a way of uh, becoming a, perhaps even closer to our best selves? And certainly tennis is a game that is, you know, rife with adversity. Right from the first point, the first game, things happen that are a little bit out of your control, and and um, and I think Dave, you, you you had mentioned this in one of our offline conversations. You know, tennis is a bit of a microcosm of what is going on in life. Uh, we don't always make the translation as mm -hmm. tennis players to put it into our lives, but I'm curious. You know, you guys have uh, typically worked very directly with people in person, but you've had to adjust your own model. Um, I'd love to hear you know, some stories about how you've transformed your own business and, and maybe what has been some of the impact on your clients or even some of the newer people that you've met because of this situation going on in the world. Yeah, great. Uh, it's a great topic. And uh, I'm really glad uh, to be here to talk about it because uh, yeah, we, we share the suffering. Uh, just as everybody's uh, dealing with this crisis and adversity right now. Um, we had to adapt um, uh, because our 99% our of our income comes from private coaching and traveling with our clients and we couldn't do that. Uh, what we did is uh, we, we thought, well, like, what can we do for ourselves? What will also greatly benefit right away uh, our subculture and maybe even beyond that? is that uh, we contacted all our clients that we normally travel with. I said, would you consider uh, continue coaching online? That we can be there for you every week or twice a week. We uh, start a program online. And most of them right away were on board. And, uh, and a secondary thought that we said, well, what can we do for our community? Uh, um, so we invited people uh, who were not clients to a free consultation. Uh, if they signed up through our website, they could ask for a free consultation. And some of those people actually became clients. Um, and some of those people who didn't become clients did find great uh, help at having had contact with a high performance coach, which gave us another vision, actually. Uh, we transformed from only dealing with high performance athletes or executive, because uh, we also do business coach. Um, we started seeing that there's another type of performance person out there. Uh, and I, I, the filter is person seeking. That's already a good filter. A person seeking help is already a great person for us to talk with because they want. They want to work. And um, we got in contact with genius kids that are going to be the future CEOs of big companies or talented uh, athletes that now cannot do what they normally do. And they are more than just tennis players. They're more than just great students. They start showing and they, we actually basically treat them as a startup companies, the same model that we use uh, when we work with startup companies. Uh, and we, we see that the online coaching has actually taken off. We have actually have a, a waiting list now for people who want to start working with us. Uh, so we're busier than ever, uh, but we had to adapt. And uh, I would like to emphasize what, what they've uh, said before the COVID, mo most coaches and uh, tennis players would focus on their selves in, as athletes only or coach only identity. And the COVID brought the focus to what uh, Dave and I focus more is the holistic approach. We see our clients as people that play tennis or coach tennis. And, uh, but uh, that was not always very clear to them. 
and the COVID make this uh, more clear. Uh, well, uh, what Brian already mentioned is, is maybe a great opportunity uh, to find another strength in yourself. And what Christina said is very true. The, the limited thought of only being a tennis player, you're being forced out of that uh, illusion uh, that you're only a tennis player or only a coach. Uh, you are many things. And I, I think with great adversity, also uh, you get a chance to see uh, how you deal with adversity and uh, what else is there. And uh, I emphasize what Brian mentioned, uh, like tennis is a microcosmos of life. And what uh, our clients are now finding out is that the courage that they displayed on court to play their own game does now have, a, they transfer now to life in general and they are being courageous to reinvent themselves, to learn about new skills, to start up companies and also to have a ripple effect, bringing others into their platforms to also grow together. And for me, and they is very inspiring to, to see that uh, also, out of a negative influence. Also, to so have much contact with Brian and Josh and doing a great job. Congratulations uh, for, for this and for the listeners. Now, if you are seeking, if you already found out about this uh, podcast, and if you're wondering to, to ask for help, it's a great strength. Uh, not knowing only when you're strong, but also knowing when you need help. Uh, this is a, a great strength also. And I think um, we we didn't really reveal this at the beginning, but uh, you know this podcast is a result of the pandemic. Uh, exactly. The, you know, me, Josh, and you, Christina, we met on uh, you know um, an applied uh, or Association for Applied Sports Psychology virtual coffee chat. We never met any of us. We had a meeting after that, and then you know Josh and I started to think about ways we could collaborate. So all of this is actually a result of transformation in that regard. And, you know, I think even Josh, think about where you are now, right? I mean, how, things have really changed for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, over these last, however many months, I think it was somewhere around nine months ago when the three of us, um, you know, met on that chat. And uh, yeah, I, I would say for, for me, certainly, you know, things are in a very different place in terms of my business, in terms of, you know, my, my new role at the International Tennis Hall of Fame, which started in September. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's a great point in terms of, uh, you know, these challenging situations that we have in life, this adversity that we face and being able to transform ourselves and being able to actually, you know, benefit um, in, in certain ways from these experiences. So I, I, I brought up this quote before from, from Ken Revisa, one of my favorite quotes that uh, adversity is, is the fertilizer to growth, uh, which I think mm -hmm. is, is great. Um, so a, a, question, a question I have for the, for the two of you is through, through your business, through uh, Rolo Mental Coaching, how do you help um, tennis players or, or other athletes, other performers? What is that, that process that you go about in terms of helping them um, you know, deal with that adversity and to transform during this time, particularly at, let's say, over the last 12 months? Well, what we, what we find out is that um, well, first there is an intake course. There has to be chemistry and there has to be compatibility. That's something that we put first when we work with uh, clients. If we don't feel the chemistry or they don't feel the chemistry, uh, there's no need to continue working. And then uh, we need to be able to present something that they really feel like they can get help with. But the for predominant right now is, is finding purpose again. Uh, and to define that through uh, goal setting and strategic planning and taking a subject that we discover in the process that is also within their skill set. And actually the, 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 the talents that they showed as a coach or as a tennis player that they started transforming in this new uh, developed thing as you and Josh, uh, Brian and Josh developed this. It's just an, 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 an eye opener that uh, we work them through a process and we give them a, a, a certain program. Uh, and during the program, we, we learned that uh, to also let go sometimes of what we had in mind because during the process, a client sometimes comes up with something like, hey, you know, I wasn't thinking about this during the first sessions, but now I've been thinking, what about this? So we let go of our program and we go in, a, in, a, in an angle which is much more beneficial for our client. And I think um, for, for, for any colleague out there um, wondering how, how you do it, it is 
of course, you go in it with a plan. You follow your own uh, your, your your program and you, you keep your ethics. Um, but definitely be willing to let go of the plan when a client is starting to show its own strength because I, I value very much uh, each individual's uniqueness and that uniqueness always is better than whatever I can come up with for, uh, for another client. And I don't know if that answers your question. I would like to emphasize something uh, of what they've said. Uh, in general, we noticed that uh, by changing people's perspective, no matter if they are coaches, athletes, or normal citizens in other areas, was the different uh, of perspective. Instead of focusing on the crisis and the obstacles and all the negative things, by helping, helping them shift to uh, solution focus, what can they do, what is under their control, and then from there, uh, with that sense of control, they are able to move forward step by step. Uh, Towards the autonomy that we always promote. And we feel uh, uh, an eye opener to responding with ego or responding to your process of growth. And um, to have that separation and we really become clear when has it to do with my ego and when is it to do with my development, really? And they realize that a lot of stuff is just ego, like asking for help or something, you know, it's an ego thing. If you just say, well, it's good for my process of growth then people who are really trained in this area, they're really open right away. Say, you know what? It's true. It's my developmental need. It's not a weakness. It's something I want to develop in. But the, the people that are getting stuck in their ego, like not wanting to admit because I used to be the CEO of this company, but now I don't have a job no more. Uh, yeah, well, uh, that's tough. Uh, if you can get out from that by training it and training yourself on a really clear what has to do with my process of becoming and what has to deal with just ego and if i can learn to filter that out of my life uh, i can get results and to complement on what they've said we also um, have found that it's very important to help our clients be interdependent establish a network of support in different areas and uh, as we did the same we are developing developing a network of experts and colleagues that can support uh, each other in several projects and in, in life in general. And by, by doing this, what they've said, by being able to ask for assistance, by being courageous to ask um, when they need uh, and also um, ask for help, but also receive from others. Uh, and willing, uh, a willingness to invest, invest time, uh, money sometimes. Uh, it's not just gonna come. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're going to be an ATP player. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things there that I, I, I'd love to just like go a little deeper on, right? So, if, you know, I think the first one, Christina, you're mentioning, you know, perspective changing. And I like to think of that, maybe this is too abstract, but it's something that people like um, Tim Ferriss, who has a very popular podcast, or Ryan Holiday, you know, promoting a lot of stoic philosophy, you know, developing your own personal philosophy on, mm -hmm. on certain things like challenges, competition, winning, losing. And, and Dave, you're mentioning the ego and, and, you know, versus sort of development. It makes me think about how we all have to somewhat detach, say, certain aspects of our lives from, from our, who we are as people, right? It's not, you know, my tennis career isn't necessarily a reflection on who I am as a human being. Yeah. My tennis career actually just sort of a project that I have that I would like to get better at, right? Yeah. Or yeah. any other aspect of your life. There are simply, you know, little things that are part of us, but they are not us exactly. in, in totality. And um, it seems like the more that we can help people through those sorts of things. So I'm curious, you know, when you talk to people about developing perspective, um, are there key things that you like to emphasize are there things you have them read etc you know how do you go about in in essence uh reprogramming mm -hmm. um how people look at this stuff yeah it's it's really good that you uh bring this up because uh, yeah well one of the things uh, you said you read uh we have written a book uh mental training in tennis uh it's uh, available on amazon uh, that's our way of uh providing a high-level coaching material for people who cannot afford uh, a personal coach. Uh, 
what we found interesting is that yeah our clients all have our book and they uh, read the the book and they can do off court work in the book because after every chapter there's exercises that you can do off court and then as soon as you can go on court with your coach you can do the on court things in the book uh, i'm really happy to <laughs> you both have our book as well uh, we feel supported uh, but to answer your question more uh, yes there's some standard things that uh, we find very important and it sounds kind of spiritual but i, I do believe that there's a scientific uh, background to it is a uh, first step is l learning to love and respect yourself and to feeling free and feeling safe in, in the process that you're you're in so to maintain persistence in the choice of working on yourself and uh, not feeling narcissistic about loving yourself. And um, that, that gives great strength. Uh, why? It's because uh, several uh, investigations show that people who love and respect themselves will listen to their instincts. They will listen to their inner voice. And when you do that, you can catch yourself from uh, doing big error and harm to yourself and not physically harm but also harm by making really poor choices and when you already have those basic foundations uh, i cannot work with a person who doesn't really love or respect what he does uh, i have to have a person to work with and i'm not here to fix everybody's problems uh, everybody has to work they do the work we give advice we give options we give tools and then they go to work it's a it's a very clear sign always for us that uh, we actually uh, physically we don't do the the coach doesn't do the player has to hit the balls on the tennis court he has to make the decisions on the tennis court uh, at the at, at the event in life also the person the client is the doer when the foundation of love and respect and uh, trust in the instinct is in place we can give like more uh, uh, practical tools like the one in the book, the car analogy, in which we help our clients uh, realize that we have, we all are, have physiology, emotions, we have uh, thoughts and we have behaviors. Um, and sometimes all these together can be overwhelming. They feel a certain way and uh, they may be uh, sick or, uh, but what can they do about all this? We help them focus on what they have control and what is it that they have control. So in the car analogy, we, we show them the steering wheel that is attached to the thinking and behavior wheel. And by uh, having control of what they think about, so we ask them to focus on affirmative speech, uh, positive uh, uh, and positive thoughts and also, we ask them to focus on positive behaviors and use the physiology and emotions as uh, warning signs, as a red flag uh, that can, when they don't feel good, they go to the steering wheel and say, okay, what is it that I'm thinking that's making me feel like this? Or what is it that I am doing that is making me feel like this? Or what is it that I am not doing that is making me feel like this? So by focusing on uh, what they think and what they do, they already make the system simple because the physiology and the emotions takes care of itself. So with this, we then uh, enter the goal setting, achievement part of it, and the strategic planning in which it's also included in the book, in which we help them establish goals, but also identify possible obstacles and specific strategies for internal and external obstacles. And we do this as a, a continuous project. Uh, it's like a continuously being updated, adjusted and uh, monitored. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear that. <laughs> so I, I think, I think um, another thing that would be helpful or you know, helpful and interesting for our, our listeners is um, to hear about about some of your work, about both of your work um, at the ATP level, um, working with players, um, you know, maybe maybe some experiences or anecdotes that uh, you know that you've had in your years uh, working at the ATP level. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I've been very blessed to be able to have traveled uh, with a top player for six years, uh, and 
it was a very unique experience and we've become really close friends over the years also and uh what I found out when I arrived uh, first at the ATP, um, I thought I was going to meet many, many of my colleagues. And I thought uh, the, the, the top 50 players, they all had somebody uh, like me on their team. And I was uh, actually unpleasantly surprised um, that uh, although there were some very impressive teams, and if you take like top, top 10 players, they have really nice, nice teams and they have all, almost everything covered. But I didn't feel that um, somebody was doing what I was doing uh, and because I focus very much on uh, where the person lives, uh, that's their life, and I don't only want to work on court or I don't want to just explain things in a classroom and then the player has to find a way to adapt it. So uh, it was really interesting to work with uh, uh, this top player and um, he already had been a top player before I met him, but he was going to stop playing tennis. He was 29 when I met him. And when you're 29 in the ATP, it's like um, almost everybody comes to ask you, uh, when are you going to retire? I don't know if Brian ha has experienced this, uh, like when are you going to quit playing? And uh, it made no sense to me because if you did, looked at uh, the, the body of the player, he looked like a 26-year-old and he stayed 26 for another six years. Uh, being really strong and healthy. Uh, but it, it was getting in his mind and it, it's, it's, his game was suffering. And we started. And at first there was some skepticism of if this is really what was going to make him play better because he, he had dropped all the way to uh, ranking 158. And uh, I don't make guarantees. Uh, I'd rather just say, you know, if we can focus on the process, then uh, ranking and making money is a, a result from quality work. Uh, if you're willing to give me some time and uh, adapt and observe what I think needs some attention, uh, then, then yes, uh, it's going to be a result that we're going to go up in the ranking. And the first thing I asked him is, are you willing to take a step down? And that was tough because he was uh, ranked 26 in the world and uh, that was his idea. I said, but I want to try some new things that are, are probably going to be very foreign to you and I would rather try that in a challenger tour, you know, and just, you know, and he, he was brave. He said, oh, you, you know what? We're not going to go to these tournaments which pay big money, you know, um, which was a, a main drive uh, at first for this player. And I said, but you, your goals, are conflicting is it making money or you want to go up in the ranking and, and let's see so we went three months we just did challengers and within three months uh, he became number one in the challenger tour uh, we got invited to sao paulo to play the, the challenger final uh, and uh, he was ranked 46 within three months so and it was it was a great experience and what did we do uh, we basically we we called it we do the work and beside, I was not going to adjust anything in this man's technical ability. He had one of the most flawless techniques in the ATP. Uh, other players um, always refer to this player as one of the most beautiful backhands uh, on the ATP. And so that was not it. So it had to be mental. And the deciding factors was that when he was all in, when he said, you know what, I, I'm convinced. Uh, he needed a physical result, so the ranking, uh, but then he was all in. And during this time of career, also things came up as, uh, what am I going to do after playing tennis? Because this identity of only being a tennis player was like the bubble that was going to burst. And many professional athletes, I went through it too when I quit basketball, what am I going to do? But during his career... Uh, the last two years, we basically said, you know what, we're going to, we still play, but we play retired and we start working on your academy and uh, we start working on your business ventures and being an ambassador for your country uh, as a tennis player. So there were like different roles developing for him and we were helping him in each area uh, to build the, the mental toughness uh, profile for him. And it became really clear. Because what I found out, even in myself, performance athletes love goals. They love targets and they love routines and they pump everything into it. So he was getting quick results. And even if uh, in a hotel uh, that he had, it's like it was one of the best hotels coming. Uh, 
He was helping his country get on the map in terms of awareness of importance of mental training. And now he has an academy. Uh, if I may say his name, can I say his name? Or of course, yeah, that's something new. Yeah, uh, his name is Victor Hamnescu, as some of you might know. And in America, he's less known, uh, but uh, he has a Victor Hamnescu uh, uh, Tennis Academy now, which was a concept when he first started. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, we uh, helped him through this process. We started with doing training camps. Uh, camps here in Romania where he's from he even got a TV award for best program ever uh, so we were very proud that everything that we had intended for him in the process he did the work but he took the, the smartest options that were presented to him by his performance coaches and what I would like to add to what they've said is uh, like this uh, award-winning program was award-winning because for the first time in Romania, they had systematic training, mental training for athletes, coaches and parents. In all areas. In all areas. And uh, we were very pleased that uh, after we helped uh, lay the foundations uh, based on uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, we we uh, developed uh, together with USCA uh, in several areas of the player's development, but also the parenting. By laying the foundations uh, for this academy, we help them also have autonomy in terms of, even when we are not with them, they continue having systematic mental training programs. And um, uh, I believe that's the way to go. Well, kind of. this story, why I wanted to choose this story is because it kind of proves that uh, it's nice that some of the colleagues that we, we talk to is that they're very focused on performance. And I find it, of course, very, very important. Uh, but it doesn't highlight the whole picture. Uh, the well-being part of the client is very, very important, which also helps in the performance area. And if we can find a, a balance in the two worlds, uh, then we get like 100% uh, return. Uh, if, if you want to have a more anecdotal story of uh, what happens in, in crisis moments uh, in ATP, um, I would like, I'd like to take a, a moment that was a, a player that uh, was playing doubles with a player that we were coaching. And this player uh, was a phenomenal player, a younger player. And the player that we were working with was already in his autumn of the career. We were helping him transition uh, out of tennis. And... Um, the doubles partner, uh, his father passed away and it was a great crisis and uh, the technical coach of that player came to us for help because uh, he knew what we, what we did for a living and uh, it was definitely a mental issue uh, there. And we said, of course, we will have a talk with him to see if there, there's chemistry and he, he's open to receive uh, coaching from us. And uh, it was really interesting where he was going to leave the tournaments uh, and to go back home. He would never have made the funeral because he had to go to another continent. Very long flight. Uh, and we actually got to talking. And let me say, this was a player about to break through, uh, ranked 200 and he was going to break through. Uh, what, what we did there is uh, with perception and we, through his agreement, uh, were establishing that he would do his father a greater honor by continuing what his father supported him in and made great investments in, uh, wouldn't it be greater to just put it all out on the court and see uh, when we uh, win the, the tournament to, to point up in disguise for you, Daddy? And it, it was a great motivator for him. And he ended up winning the three tournaments in the three weeks. And he broke through to the top 100s and he's still top 100 player. It, uh, it was a great moment where, where crises when handled correctly, can actually be a, a, a motivator to, to have a positive effect. Yeah, I think those are cool stories, both Victor and that player, because they, I mean, they're, they're making me think of a couple of themes, you know, one being um, the idea of creating some meaning around something, right? And, and, you know, I think, Dave, you were giving that player some meaning to continue to, to, to move forward and play, right? And it, being it for his father, and I... I think I remember hearing you say, like, honor was a really big part of that, yeah, that young yeah. man's character, right? Yes. But it also makes me think of, like, Andre Agassi, you know, who, you know, in his book Open talks about how he openly hated tennis mm -hmm. until he found some purpose. 
And that yeah. purpose was really in, in, in what you were doing for Victor Hanescu is developing that transition plan and how tennis could fuel that. And I think we're also perhaps seeing that with Rafael Nadal, who is obviously still playing at a, a very high level, but now he's got this academy. It's going global. He's got, I think, what one in Mexico, one in Dubai. He's got the one in Mallorca. Um, and so it's really nice to see people working with these high-level athletes about how they can transition so that they don't lose themselves. You know, they don't sit on the couch and drink and get fat and and, and, yeah. and those types of things, which, which – you know, I think you saw more so maybe in American sports back in the 80s and the 90s when people didn't have anything to do afterwards or they didn't handle the transition well. So I think it's fantastic work that you guys are doing that it's keeping the whole person in mind, not just the player, not just the problem, but much more of a person-oriented type of approach. Yeah, it's great that other professionals are, are doing the same because uh, being a performance athlete myself, uh, having fallen into that black abyss, uh, I really, really can uh, identify how it feels to all of a sudden feel like you're nobody and nobody really cares for you no more. Nobody shouting your names or uh, writing their letters on their chest and you know, <laughs> screaming your name all these things were great experiences but they were actually uh, the greatest experience were becoming traumas because i felt like i no longer existed and uh, what i find is when i work with uh, the athletes uh, a great advantage when they look me in the eye and we're talking about this kind of stress and is uh, crises that they see that it lives in me as, as well that i know how they feel so empathy and sympathy uh, played a big role in uh, the, the openness to be successful. And you mentioned Rafa Nadal and other athletes. It's, it's great that uh, somebody took the time and effort to uh, expand the minds to not only be a legend in tennis, uh, you can be legendary for other people as well. And instead of being famous, you can become infamous, infamous in, a, in, a, in a most positive way for a, a whole culture and perhaps the whole world. I think I, th I think that's I think that's a great point that you're bringing up. I think uh, I would point to to Federer as another example of this um, through the, his foundation and all the work that um, he's done in Africa. And I think I would you know Federer and Nadal are both great examples of players um, whose identity isn't just based on them as a tennis player, as a, as an athlete or sportsman, but it's they've crafted that identity as uh, a little bit broader than that as what uh, what they do through their foundation or through Rafa, through his academy. Um, so I, I think, uh, and, and uh, this concept of retirement and the end of a player's career isn't something we've addressed too much on, on this podcast, but as it relates to sports psychology, it's, it's certainly an important concept as it relates to players getting injured or careers coming to an end. Um, one, one thing that I think is, is often important is uh, helping a player to have to have that identity be a little broader rather than them just as an athlete. Okay. What else do you enjoy? Where else, um, what else do you value? You know, where else can you make a difference? Maybe it's, as you said, on TV or through a foundation or through, uh, through coaching other people through your own expertise, um, are, I, through, through your experiences for, for both of you, Christina and Dave, have you worked with other players, um, in this transition process of players careers? Yes. Yes, uh, of course. And uh, Victor is being uh, a very, very uh, big uh, uh, exposure of that. Uh, what you mentioned that uh, Rafa Nadal and uh, Federer are doing in uh, their uh, their world, Victor is doing for his country, uh, yep. which is a country that doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, it's, it produces great athletes, uh, uh, but normally in only one niche. And uh, what I find so fantastic is that he was able to just let go of his status as a famous uh, tennis player in his country. And he's there on court also helping players. Uh, yes, and traveling with the player to a challenger. Okay, he's doing that. And he's willing to just let go of all the ego parts and, and say, you know what, what's the best for, for myself uh, as a person developing? And uh, how can other people's benefit that, uh, from this? So, uh, and what he reports is that he, he wishes that we would have met when he was 20. <laughs> he said, I wish I would have met you earlier. 
because I played many matches that I felt like I could have won, but because I was worried, I, I lost uh, in, in finals where he was about to win a tournament. And, and he said, I would have had more tournaments on my name. Uh, he's convinced of it. And I'm convinced of it too, because uh, where he grew up, um, he, he basically mentioned, Dave, uh, you're the only professional element in my life. Uh, I have great loving people around me. I've had a good technical coach, but how you approach performance or high performance and well-being, I've never had contact with that. And if you name Rafa Nadal and, and uh, uh, Roger Federer, although I have good, tremendous respect for these two individuals, they have another kind of subculture around them. They have all kinds of professionals with marketing, uh, which gives great strength which Victor did not have. He came from a poor country with a very poor knowledge about mental training. And uh, for him to do and have done what he's done, uh, I feel maybe not in terms of trophies is in the same level, but um, in definitely in terms of output and, and, and showing what can be done when you apply yourself, it's on the same level. And if you uh, give me the words, I would like to add something to Dave's uh, statement. Uh, in this transition phase of our uh, clients' careers, one thing that we have noticed is um, what is also in the, the USDA book in the chapter about giving back, being of service and giving back. And uh, Victor Anespi is giving precisely back to the community what he never had uh, when he was a young player and is now providing the conditions to uh, for the, these youth players, talented players, to have a platform so they can reach uh, the highest uh, they can. And uh, that makes us uh, happy uh, <laughs> to, to be able to inspire others to be of service and, uh, and uh, to leave a legacy uh, that can live on. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know even USTA player development, and Christina, of course, you know Dr. Larry Lauer very well. You know, and that's uh, character development is a big part of what player development is doing at the USTA now and having, you know, seven specific character traits that they believe help create a, a, a great competitor, a mentally tough competitor. And, and part of that is, um, uh, you know, is that giving back aspect of things and, and, and playing sort of beyond yourself. Um, I'd love to get back to the book a little bit if we can, because I know you guys, that that's a project that... Uh, you two are very, very proud of. Yes. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you know this is something that's written really for you know people who might not be able to work with you, but this is almost you know a mental guide to or mental training guide to how to become a better player. I think in reading it myself, it's it's very easy to read. It's not just for coaches and sports psych professionals, as maybe some other books could be. It's certainly digestible by parents. And, and, and players, maybe of a certain age, you know, you know maybe. Yeah. Even uh, athletes like uh, nine-year-olds, they have been able to, to read, understand, and the analogies uh, and images really help them get the concepts in a fun way. Right, right. And I think it, you know, it begins in a good way with you guys going into, you know, why mental training, right? So uh, I, I'd love to, you know, they are, people can obviously read it, but give, give me your take on, on why this type of training really is necessary if you are to, you know, develop your, that project of yourself as a tennis player. Uh, can I answer? Yes, no, yes. I, okay. It's, it's so uh, interesting because yeah, why uh, it's actually, it's interesting in this conversation, but when you're playing tennis, it's not important. <laughs> why am I playing so good or why? Uh, Cause that's actually makes you think too much. And we wanted to say, okay, isn't it great if you could just ask, uh, enter into your best tennis playing self? And that actually is the, the variable that's very confusing for most people. We're training people to get out of their mind uh, because the mind is not helping you play tennis. Uh, so it's more like to learn to master when am I thinking and when am I doing? Uh, which part of the court should I never be thinking? And which part of the court should I be thinking and strategizing? and leaving things from off the court, off the court, and only things that are specific to the tennis or tennis match to get to your performance. 
so what Josh, uh, I think, already highlighted uh, in another podcast that it's about them, or no, I think it was you, Brian, that it's about that match point. It's about that, that moment that you feel like, okay, I can now, early in the match, put my mark on this match to, to later on have the result of winning. And, um, but if you don't know that your own mind is causing you to play against yourself, uh, it's been said before, the worst opponent you can play against is yourself. Uh, if you can shut down, shut down the mind and actually let your body play calmly, relaxedly, with, with, with grace and assertiveness, yeah, then you're going to stroke the balls clean and you're going to hit them and you're going to see the ball because many even professional players mentioned to me that they, I'm not seeing the ball. It's coming too fast. I said, well, where's your mind? I said, okay, I was with the last point. Oh, okay, well, then you're late because your, your physiology actually thinks it's the past. And if your mind is not focused on the here and now, you're not seeing the ball. I said, are you seeing the ball from the blade? from the opponent's blade? Are you seeing it from there? Or are you only seeing it when it bounces in your court? And these questions raise their awareness that, whoa, you know what? I'm in the past. And why, 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 and, and, and why mental training is important is to get back to the present. And that's the ball. The <laughs> ball is literally, for me, a metaphor. That's the present. Now the present is on the other side. Now it's here, my side. Now it's there. So, and it's basically constantly training the mind to stay focused on the present and yeah it's easy said and, uh, uh, we've written things in our book that can greatly help you uh, on, on, on to get started in the area of mental training I will never compare your or Josh or my work uh, with only the book uh, working with a coach is of course is going to have uh, different uh, faster results but that's what was our idea was is to, to at least open it's like why is it important? Because you hear a lot of commentators, his head is not in the game, you know? And why does he say that? Because the commentator can see that he's not completely in the present. He missed the ball in American football. You guys just had the Super Bowl. You see things fumble and you open his hands all the way. He's like not concentrated. That's why he didn't catch the ball. Uh, it's, it's not a, a technical thing, especially strength. I mean, there's a certain plateau reached in, in the physical, uh, in, in the mind. Yeah. When you know what to do, doing the right thing at the right time gives your talent and your body the best chance to play what your potential is. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, I'm not going to say mental is more important than any other areas. But the crucial moments in matches is 90% mental. Exactly. And if you allow me, Brian, going back to your question about uh, explaining sports psychology and the book itself, the book itself was a product of um, uh, when uh, we did in 2007 a coaching clinic for the elite coaches in Portugal. Uh, for the first time, they went to do uh, sports psychology, mental coaching on court. And they, they because they were experiencing things, applying and seeing immediate results, they asked us to uh, develop uh, a resource, uh, this book. Uh, yeah, to highlight, they had to play tennis. These in coaches had to play tennis. They were not in a classroom learning about mental coaching. They had to play tennis. And because and they felt that uh, was such a good resource, they said, could you, Dave and Christina, uh, make uh, a book and exercises for us, but also for parents and athletes, so we could uh, start developing this area in Portugal. So two years later at the major tournament ATP in Portugal, uh, it was uh, interesting because at the beginning of the book, you have a share analogy, uh, a, a chair just with three legs initially, physical, technical, and tactical. That's what I found at the National Tennis Center when I started working, one leg was missing. And what uh, I saw was uh, in the satellite tournaments, kids that during the week were playing like fantastic, they would be like uh, in competition they would be choking in uh, like tie breaks that they could win, they would losing, would be losing. And uh, that made me think, and it happened again at that major ATP tournament in 2009. We had uh, plenty of uh, male and female top athletes that were like in tie breaks that they could have won. And I remember in our book launch, the tournament director, Joan Lago, she mentioned, it's amazing that we had so many players almost going to the next round and they didn't. Exclus exclusively because of mental aspects. So this book, Christina and Dave, is an awesome resource and I trust that 
is going to contribute to have uh, mental um, develop the mental toughness of it's our It's actually a very common phenomenon, not just in Portugal. Uh, across the globe, where I go, I hear coaches talking to me that Dave, I have a practice player. What do I do? Because in competition, he can't perform. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm speaking to these coaches on the fly. Uh, it's not like I'm really working with these coaches, but they ask me. So if you can quickly say something, what is one thing that I can already start doing? I said, quit making a difference between practice and competition. Because it's a subconscious thing that, uh, ah, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, either it matters always or everything is practice. I said, you make, uh, make a choice for your player. Is, is everything a test? Because uh, I like uh, just treating everything as practice. I mean... You, you play a match. We, we even, like I said, with Victor and I, uh, we went to Sao Paulo. It was kind of pre-season time because it's very late in the season. He had three test rackets and we were going to play a, a different kind of uh, tactic. And we used the tournament to, to test rackets. <laughs> and it's like never been done before. It, uh, no player really does that. Uh, and it, it was amazing. Uh, he, he only uh, wasn't able to win all the matches, I feel, for my because he, he broke two strings in the record and he had to play with it. A, a test record was completely off balance. And really, really tough to adjust to. Uh, but uh, he was brave to just use the tournament as, uh, as practice uh, because that was our philosophy. Because winning was not only the thing on our mind. Uh, we wanted to build a game and to make the game come out. And uh, we judged ourselves in terms of winners. Did we play our game? Did we play our game at the most level that we could produce it and uh, but I've also worked with an MMA fighter that uh, everything everything was competition every sparring partner got the full blast it was never like 80% or 60% no uh, there were sparring partners carried off within minutes already and that had come another sparring partner because he was everything he wanted to win everything and, and that's I think a clear decision what is practice what is the but make it clear for your player or for uh, as a coach do you want to have everything be practice as a life of learning yeah that's my philosophy life of learning or are you everything competition yeah and whatever you choose i think maybe the common theme is there to understand that regardless everything is always on the line for you you know and that's actually a line from a Josh Waitzkin, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He uh, is actually the subject of the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. So he was a chess prodigy as a, as a youngster. And then when he was around 18, he transitioned and became world judo champion. <laughs> Completely different thing. But what he has, he's written a great book called The Art of Learning. Awesome. Um, and he, he's similar to you guys, works with a lot of um, you know executives and you know, very um, in-depth work at that level. But I, uh, you know, highly recommend that book to, to people to you know, in terms of the art of learning. But I learned of him through this book that you might also like, guys, called "The Fighter's Mind." It's one of my favorite books about fighting uh, sports because tennis is a fight. Mm -hmm. It's a combat sport. It's one on one. The way it's set up is a bit trickier. It mm -hmm. probably makes things a little bit more mental in some regards because unlike uh, a fight in which, you know, like in MMA, you you know what's happening there. You know, you don't have time to say, oh, why did I miss that punch? <laughs> right? um, but in tennis, you get a lot of that time to be judgmental about certain things. So I love the idea of, of uh, everything is practice because I'm sure Josh hears it. I, I saw him nodding when you said – that, you know, practice players, we practically hear it on a daily basis that someone plays better in practice than they do in matches. And um, I think that's a great piece of advice is can you, again, about the ego, separate the wins and the losses and understand, hey, this is simply a project. That tournament is another opportunity for me to push things forward more. It's another learning opportunity. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it's a great concept. And uh, I don't... Because sometimes people come to me, parents are like, uh, I blame the technical coach. And I always say, he's not to, he's not to blame because he's been trained to teach your kid technical things. He's not supposed to see that due to the way things have been developing, 
the player has assumed that practice is practice and matches is our matches. It was not his job. So uh, I actually saved some technical coaches to, uh, from being fired. Uh, <laughs> I said, because it's, it's not fair, it's not his job. And uh, just know that now we are working on it to, uh, in the future. Uh, it will not be a difference no more. Uh, but perhaps maybe federations could uh, invest a little bit more to have coaches who are being trained to get aware of a phenomenon that produces practice player. Uh, this is nobody's fault, of course. It's just a phenomenon that, uh, yeah, if there's no uh, professional in the mental area, then at least somebody can detect like, oh, you know what, this is what's going on. And it's not such a strange because I've seen kids cry and really wonder why can I not play and explain to the parents is like I don't know because uh, the parents say what well, in practice you play so well and I don't understand it and then comes the pressure and, and it's, it's a very sad phenomenon and then all of a sudden we see the relief when they start getting answers in this question like yes I'm making the wrong assumption here and then with awareness again it starts improving. I think, I think that's a great point. I mean, a, a couple of things that were, that were coming to mind. Um, number one, talking about uh, helping the players sort of get out of their own mind. Um, you were talking about, you know, not when you're thinking so much, it's impossible to actually perform, which reminded me a lot of the, the book, the inner game of tennis yeah. and how Tim, Tim Galloway, and I see you both nodding there, but I, you know, how yeah. he talks a lot about how we want to clear the mind, not be judgmental as we're performing, just try to, you know, see things as they are rather than constantly judging, judging the performance. And then also this, this concept of, um, you know, performance being somehow different during practice and when we were competing and, and how, as Brian said, we, we hear this on a daily basis that, you know, my player plays so much worse during, during uh, matches compared to competition. How can we bridge that gap? How can we help our player to perform well as well during uh, competition or even better? And uh, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, starting to change that perspective on, Hey, each, each match, this is not the end all be all. It's not, there'll be plenty more matches in our, in our future this is just a piece to that puzzle of becoming a better, more complete tennis player. Uh, but I, a question that a, a question I have for the two of you, and this is based on based on those concepts, but also ties into the book and that uh, the chair analogy, the the different um, you know the, the different legs that have to be that a player needs to be standing on or that chair needs to be standing on. How can we start to help players from a young age? develop the the mental component so that they have that mental foundation from the time that they're developing as a junior athlete and that they don't need to learn that piece later on when maybe they've had, you know, struggles mentally, melt meltdowns or choking or whatever it is. How can we start to bridge that gap through coaching and through sports psychology to, to help players have that foundation as they're learning the sport? I think uh, this would be great for Christina because yes. she was at the Root Foundation also helping to develop the, the stages of development for the USDA. So exactly. this is great. It's a great tool and uh, can be found at the USDA site. And it's actually uh, a tool that is being, being used in different countries in Europe uh, to help coaches and players also uh, have like a, a framework to develop uh, in terms of technical, tactical, physical, and mental. And for the young ages, uh, one of the focus is fun and enjoyment. But when we can, um, since early age, instill that, uh, uh, not just the player focus on that, but we help uh, coaches and parents create an environment that is conducive to that uh, enjoyment and fun, we are contributing to um, not just have uh, more players playing because they will eventually continue playing, uh, but create uh, healthier uh, individuals as well. And um, also the respect, uh, learn how to deal with winning and losing in these ages is fundamental. And we have noticed that uh, the younger uh, clients which we uh, worked with, um, it was a critical phase when they got uh, these uh, skills to, to deal with winning and losing and seeing things as a learning uh, process uh, to get their game developed to when they get to ITF and ATP, they actually can 
can do. They have the mental skills, the, the physical, technical, tactical, all in place to have that chair with the four legs strong. Uh, by giving that uh, those skills at early ages, then we make it so that it's easier for coaches and players to achieve their potential. Well, yeah, great that you say that because when you get to the ATP level, uh, at first uh, you, everything seems magical. Uh, but I, uh, when I get into the scene, uh, I basically prepare them for losing every week. Uh, unless you win every tournament, you have to get learning, learning to lose every week. Uh, it might be first round, might be quarterfinals, but you're going to have losses every week, every week, and having to deal with that. And uh, if your focus is only on winning, then you're, not, you're going to burn up. If your focus is on learning every single time and rescheduling the plan and the game and, and we're going to develop as, as a tennis uh, uh, lover of tennis and, and, and that's when if the stages in the de development has been done correctly, I notice when a player has been in his childhood can connect again with the fun and the joy of just stroking the ball nice and uh, hitting it really well and clean and focusing on playing the rally and uh, playing through instinct. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm hitting it well. Okay, it, it went out like this much, but okay. It's, and then you see all of a sudden, I can work with a player like that. Because traveling with a player and it's only bad and it's only complaining. And uh, a coach can only take so much after a while. Uh, and, and I see coaches actually losing weight and they're sad and absorbing all this negativity of players sometimes. I said, don't do it. I mean, uh, either the, the player learns to lose or you should find another player because you, you can't do it because you can actually do physical harm to yourself as a coach. And these were tennis coaches and they were mental coaches also. Uh, you, that, that, that when the development stages have been done correctly, uh, uh, a good professional can use the, the memory of how fun it used to, excuse me, how fun it used to be and then it can become at the same fun at professional level. Because I remember when I was a basketball player, there was a point where I didn't want to talk about basketball. Anybody. I would talk about tennis anytime. But there was a rule in my house. I said, Daddy, Mommy, you can talk about basketball when I talk about it. But otherwise, don't talk to me about basketball. It was getting too much. And I, I can see that in tennis players too who travel 50 weeks in a year. Uh, they're going. They're going absolutely out of their minds uh, when they don't know how to lose. Mm -hmm. I would like to add something to Dave's uh, statement. Uh, one thing, a tool for the audience that uh, has been helpful for us and very simple is uh, the famous uh, sentence: "When you don't win, you." And some people say you lose, but with us is when you don't win, you learn. And what we do is, no matter which level, if it is beginning or top player, when you lose, you write down in your log, what did I learn from this situation that what, I can improve? And how can I improve so this doesn't happen next time? Or what did work well today that I can use next time? And interestingly, uh, the good thing is, uh, no matter when, they can always go back to those notes and say, hey, okay, I didn't remember this, it worked really well in the past, so okay, let me try again to use it. And uh, often uh, players uh, can go back to uh, mm -hmm. the states uh, of uh, flow performance in certain uh, With areas. this perception, with this, you actually win. Yes. You actually start feeling like a winner every time. If you have the perception not only on the ranking, not only on the money, which has been produced so much in the tennis club culture, because the first question when we arrived home the first fan asking Victor to sign the ball said, how much money did you make? Uh, what's your ranking today? And it's like, mm, you know, so it's sometimes you have to have a really tough uh, duck's back, I say, you know, uh, let it just slide off uh, and focus back on what we are doing uh, is because there is a lot of naivety out there. And the irony of what I wanted to mention when Josh was uh, talking about mental, uh, that is uh, actually getting out of your mind. And it's funny that it's called mental training, uh, to get out of the mind. So some people have the idea that uh, the, uh, the books that I read, as much knowledge I can acquire and I'll get better in my game. Uh, uh, we actually want players to think less when they're playing. Yeah, it's almost like decluttering the mind. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think there's there's some really good themes to to end on. You know, the idea of learning, the idea of fun. These are universal concepts that whether you're an ATP professional or a six year old playing in you know Red Bull, um, you know, that we want to want to try to use. Right. So, um, well, guys, thanks so much for appearing on our podcast. We'd love to have you back for you know some more chats on different different topics, but. Um, I know Josh and I are both very appreciative of your time today. And, and again, thank you very much. Well, thank you as well. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. We are great admirers of uh, what you're doing together. We want to wish you uh, a lot of success uh, in your future endeavors. And if there's anything that we can do to support your efforts over there in the United States, uh, we are more than happy to uh, assist colleagues in the field. Thank you, both. Thank you for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Brian and uh, Josh. And I look forward to our next uh, meeting together or our next podcast or project. Well, that was a great conversation, Brian. And uh, I would say one of my biggest takeaways was from their book, and we we talked about this during the conversation of the the chair analog the chair analogy of the four legs of the chair, the uh, the mental piece the technical piece, the tactical piece, and the physical piece, and how each leg is really pivotal to the stability of the chair and you know the stability of, of that player and ultimately of their, their success and their well-being. Um, and I think this is a great, um, a, a great tool that we can discuss with athletes as well of any level, junior athletes, um, adult athletes. I think it's a simple enough concept that pretty much anyone can wrap their head around it. And um, I've received the question before, is the mental piece more important? Is it less important? What percent um, of the of sports is mental? And I think um, by discussing this analogy, it's a good way to understand that the mental piece is a big piece to the puzzle, but it's um, you have to have all of the different components. You, you have to be sound physically. You have to be sound technically. You have to be, be sound tactically and then, and then uh, mentally as well. You have to have all the pieces, all of the mental skills, mental tools, as well as the, the tools in these other areas. So I really like, like that analogy. Yeah, I think that is good. It's, you know, it highlights the different fundamental components of training. And, and so when, you know, when we, an athlete wants to get better, they need to look at all the components, not just you know, those three, the technical tactical and, and physical piece, which is sort of what we get obsessed about, right? Or the industry often puts more emphasis there. And um, yeah, realizing that that mental component, it's just going to become part of your training as opposed to sometimes people only get into mental training when they feel like there's some sort of issue, lack of confidence, nerves, etc. But if we could look at it more from the perspective of this is just a fundamental thing we need to do to enhance performance, maybe maybe the perspective is different. So I, I yeah I, I agree. I think that was good. The takeaway that I really liked was the concept of everything is practice, and we mentioned this in the conversation. We hear very often players say that they play better in practice than they do in, in say a tournament or some competition, and the very quote unquote simple answer to that is just make everything practice, and. I think it's uh, while people can sort of rationally get their head around it, you have to try it out and and actually be out there saying, this is practice, this is practice, this is practice. And it's a good way to look at your own tennis game as not about you and not about wins and losses and how that either makes you a good player or not a good player or increases your UTR or not. It's like a little just piece of you. It's a project that you're working on, you're just trying to make it better day by day, and you can learn something every single day that you play. Win, lose, whatever, doesn't matter. You can learn through through practice. And so I really like that concept. It's something um, I've even started to use with some of the people that I work with as you know who have that that issue. And um, and I think it can help. It's but it it I, I also think as as Dave mentioned in his story, it took a little bit to convince people, right? So I think that even if you're a coach or a sports psych professional, there has to be some patience with developing that perspective. So, all right. Well, that's our show for today. Once again, many thanks to Christina Rollo and Dave DeHaan for being our guests. And thank you for listening. For more on today's show, please check out the show notes 
If you have any feedback or questions, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, which includes YouTube, so that you can be notified of new episodes. Also, check out our Instagram page, which also has new notifications. And thanks again. Talk to you soon in our next episode.